so for this day, we're going to be talking about document analysis. So, document analysis is actually one of the very few approaches in coding analysis, in which it is by far the most difficult to go off. Because primarily, when we conduct document analysis, we rely solely on our interpretation that stays on our reading comprehension level. So it basically sums up how we understand the text that we actually read. So therefore, it has a major tendency to become subjective. That's why document analysis is by far only done by those who actually have the proper orientation to most of the documents that they have, the proper orientation of most of the readings that they have when they should they acquire a lot of a lot of research materials. So with that being said, let's ponder on the idea on how document analysis can be expertly handled even by students with uh, even by students in coming from the high school level, of course. Most probably the high school level may somehow provide us with mediocre levels. So essentially this discussion might up our ante a bit, uh, might up the ante a bit when it comes to how we practice the research in general, this quite particularly in qualitative research. So, of course, before we ponder on the practice of document analysis, let us first discuss what is the purpose or the primary functions of these documents and why they are so reliable, where are they even counted or even rendered as something that's, that can be cited in research. So, According to Bowen and Van 2009, documents, or primarily the purpose of documents as to how or why they are published, is that they essentially provide context. They provide context that explains a certain scenario. Therefore, it enlarges the possibility that the document that you're actually reading may find a way for it to be connected to your own experiences. Because basically, it comes from the logic of us selecting our reading materials. Most probably, as readers, we tend, we tend to select readings based on which is the more relevant, which is more relevant for us, which is more easier for us to read, which is more significant based on our experiences. We tend to look for readings that have the same pattern of thought in terms of our experiences. So when we provide, uh, when we look for documents, most probably we look for the context of the document before we fully accept them as relevant studies or related literature at most. So when we provide context to further, to further the notion, when we provide context, it actually goes and actually it actually provides deeper discussions. It provides deeper discussions for the claim to be further uh, to be further uh, to further evolve. It does not necessarily leave as a single statement. Rather, rather, there's a full depth analysis based on the context that's provided by the document. After this, uh, after this video, expect that I will be conducting a sample. Uh, expect that I will be conducting a sample analysis based on how document analysis is actually actually performed. So, to continue. Aside from providing context, document analysis also enables us to ask questions, to continuously be inquisitive about most of the claims about the documents that we actually read in relation to most of our findings. So what do these documents have in common as well as what are their major differences that make them so significant in relation to our, uh, in relation to our findings in real life? Because essentially, we can compare the, we can compare the significance of both the document and the experience, the document and the experience, by two considerations. Document, so long as it has not been proven, it should remain as dogma. Dogma, by the way, is a theory that is not necessarily proven by practice. And when we refer to experience. When we refer to experience, or essentially whatever you find whenever you conduct data gatherings and whatnot, whenever you conduct questionnaire answerings and others like that, so essentially the experiences becomes it becomes empiricism. Empiricism is essential. Empiricism or empirical data is close data that's 
limited to mere practice, but no theoretical discussion whatsoever. So, the point of document analysis is to combine both, to combine both dogma and empiricism, to turn it into praxis. The praxis of the document is basically one of the most relevant, uh, is basically one of the most relevant techniques you could do to somehow prove that your document is actually significant to your research. So long as it is consistent or so long as it has the same conditions that are met by your experiences and by the nature of the study itself, then consider those readings or those documents as significant to the study. Why? Because both in the theoretical and the empirical field, they are proven as correct and relevant. So it's not really a matter of right or wrong. It's not even a matter of what's the correct notion of things and whatnot. It's a matter of which is more significantly realistic. What, what is more versed in social reality? That's what we're after, actually. So aside from asking questions, of course, it's already a given that documents provide us with supplementary data. It provides us with the necessary readings, the necessary offers, the related offers, or the early stage materials that could somehow be rendered relevant to the nature of our research project. So of course, inevitably, it will provide us with supplementary data that might support the raw findings that we have. That's the most important. See, again, I'd like to highlight the idea of praxis here. We need to somehow develop a notion wherein we begin to compare the documents that we have with the actual experience, with what is currently being practiced by the normal folk in actual and real life. In relation to that, what do the books suggest? So, when this comparison has come into play, then unconsciously we conduct synthesis among those. So, ultimately, I will highlight further on that nature of synthesis in documents. So, aside from doing so, documents also keeps us trapped with the current changes and development. See, in documents, we could actually use them as spaces. Based, ah, we could actually use them as spaces in terms of how a certain idea or how a certain practice is propagated throughout time. How a certain, mm, how a certain practice is actually evolving throughout the times that most probably has passed by most of the previous respondents coming from your eye, uh, coming from the other researches that you have. So. When we track changes and development, we could analyze we could analyze it based on the documents that we have. We can use news articles, we can use hmm, we can use paintings based on how it evolved in terms of the concept and whatnot, in terms of it, in terms of its comprehensibility as well as its intelligibility. So we could actually we could actually track the change or the drastic change and the major developments that occur given a single idea given a single idea and given a single interpretation that we have in our study in relation to the relevant document that we have used. So finally the document itself stands as our second opinion or the third party opinion. Why? Because primarily it aims to verify and corroborate our findings as well as our evidences. So initially these documents could somehow provide us with a bird's eye uh, with a bird's eye view based on how previous researchers actually pulled off the initial interpretation and the initial interpretive study that we are now trying to prove. Because essentially, we need to believe in the notion that nothing is original anymore. Most probably, most of your research articles derive from a certain author. They're essentially derived from a certain practice. Therefore, it is not rendered original anymore. However, it, is not necessary, it does not necessarily mean that our researchers are insignificant. Why? Because we need to study based on how it has changed throughout time. We also need to verify whether it is still relevant or not. What are the concepts that existed in 2010 that are no longer relevant in 2020? What are the major ideas that were existed in 1995 that are no longer discussed or no longer rendered as relevant and correct? 
in 2015, etc., etc. So, you get the point. It is also used to verify and compare points of views coming from intergenerational authors, coming from, an author, coming from authors that are essentially generations apart. So, when we use documents, we get a glimpse of history. We essentially get a glimpse of how people, of, uh, how people actually think during those times. So, these are the major purposes of documents. Now, in document analysis, we need to pay attention to most of the follow uh, most of the following details. So, we can also refer to document analysis as close reading. Close reading is a practice. Uh, close reading is a practice wherein we begin to skim down. We begin to chop down the parts of the ideas presented in the documents into necessary concepts. So essentially, in close reading, we provide avenues We provide avenues for concept division. We provide avenues for concept division in that sense. Why? Because we actually want to chunk down all of the ideas presented in the documents that we need to study in the first place. So, the following are examples, or essentially the, pro the primary elements that you need to pay attention to when it comes to analyzing documents, or essentially when doing the practice of close reading. So, first of course, is the author. Uh, we need to somehow relate the relevance of the author based on how he is actually reliable. Is he a Nobel Prize recipient? Is he a necessary professional figure when it comes to that? Because basically, we cannot have a political scientist doing neurobiology. We cannot have, we cannot have molecular biologists doing and discussing politics at the same time, right? So, of course, we need to find consistency as well as the proper alignment of our authors based on their professional integrity. So, of course, we, of course, ah, so of course, we need to pay attention to the type of the author. Next, of course, is the context. As I have explained earlier, a, we need to provide a short orientation or even a short backgrounder, a major summary of, or the synopsis of the text that we actually read. So a synopsis of the text is actually very helpful because essentially, we, by summarizing the idea, we are now able to look at the document, not necessarily, not necessarily as a chunk of ideas, but rather as a whole generalized point. That's the major idea on why we need to study context even deeper. And usually, we, go, we do that by pawing through the actual document itself. See, in most, ano, in, most, in most movies, like for example, the movie The Young Karl Marx, we see Karl Marx spreading all of his papers literally in order for him to repattern and re restructure most of his writings. So this is, actually, this is actually a very healthy practice when it comes to most students. They need to learn, or essentially we need to learn, how to paw through hardcore data, how we need to paw or how we literally need to go through each single document by the page, by the letter. So, by doing so, aside from the context, we need to also pay attention to the intended, audi to the intended audiences of our major documents. Our major documents, of course, have a wide range, uh, have a wide range of audiences that they need to address their studies to. So, of course, we also need to study that. Aside from doing so, we ultimately state the purpose of that certain document. Why was the document published in the first place? What specific need did it want to address? Because of course, we need to recall that research is problem-based, right? And of course, it's also solution-based, solution ultimately. So of course, we need to define the purpose as to why and how the document itself was published. We need to scrutinize the legitimacy of the document itself. And as researchers, we have the luxury to do so. Now, let's go to the fifth one. We also need to render the type of document that we are trying to study. Like for example, these types of documents can come in a wide range of forms. Like for example, photos or photographs 
are actually counted as, legit, as legitimate documents. These are uh, these are and can be studied based on the based on the elements that they have. Aside from aesthetic, of course, the content and the historical relevance of itself already poses a lot of avenues for photos to be discussed in a qualitative respect. Furthermore, aside from photos, pamphlets, government issued documents, newspaper articles, diary entries, it can, it can even go as far as studying paintings, studying drawings, studying visual art, studying types of books, studying poetry, and others like that. So, when studying documents, we need to widen the range of the type of document that we have because ultimately, what we are after is to provide ourselves with profound knowledge. Profound knowledge is, by the way, one of the most genuine forms of knowledge systems that by far can only be produced by the document analysis. Uh, well, aside from the interview itself, which directly comes from the respondent, but ultimately, it can also be provided by the document. Why? Because whatever is written in the document, that purely came from the author itself. So therefore, when we conduct document analysis, we are directly studying the thought patterns of the actual researcher itself. So, while doing so, after determining the type of document, we also begin to ask, or it is actually demanded to ask the following questions. What are the main points of the document? What are the provided main ideas presented in the document and whatnot? And secondly, its significance. Why is its significance? Same thing as to the per I, same thing as the question regarding the purpose. Why is the paper published during that time specifically? Why is there a need for a paper like the one you are reading right now? Why is there a need for it to be published? Why is it there why is there a need for it to be written in the first place? So essentially we need to question that in order for us to effectively go through the very detail of document analysis. So after this video, expect that I will be posting another video based on how I actually do the practice of document analysis. So, in order for you to get a heads up, I, I would like to suggest that you read Pat, Professor Patrick Flores from University of the Philippines, Diliman. The title of the paper, ay, the title of the paper is, hmm, the title of the paper is The Allegory of Philippine Art. Everything and uh, The Allegory of Philippine Art. Try looking for that paper online. So that when you get to see the next lecture video that I'm about to, that I'm about to post later, then you would most probably be oriented by how I actually did it based on the current principles that I have in document analysis. So ultimately, I'd like to expect you to ha if you have any questions, I would like to I would like to all of you or essentially the general viewers of this video to essentially put the comments down below. Just leave a comment, I'll try my very best to answer those of your questions. I will use all of the time, all of the energy that I have to somehow provide enlightenment to most of the lessons that I'm talking to, the, the, to the most of the lessons that I'm tackling as of this day. So, if you have a question, just leave a comment, and by doing so, also leave a like on this video, and of course, spread the word, spread this video, share this video to those, uh, to those who you think might need it. So, again, thank you very much. Stay safe and stay